Fear and loathing as a phrase has been used by many writers, the first possibly being Friedrich Nietzsche in The Antichrist. In a Rolling Stone magazine interview, Hunter S. Thompson said, it came out of my own sense of fear and is a perfect description of that situation to me. However, I have been accused of stealing it from Nietzsche or Kafka or something. It seemed like a natural thing. He first used the phrase in a letter to a friend written after the Kennedy assassination, describing how he felt about whoever had shot President John F. Kennedy. In the Kentucky Derby as decadent and depraved, he used the phrase to describe how people regarded Ralph Steadman upon seeing his caricature of them. Co-founder of Rolling Stone magazine Jan Winner claims that the title came from Thomas Wolfe's The Web and The Rock. Whatever the origin, the story that first bore its name as well as its author would both become forces of nature. Welcome to House of Words, a podcast about writers, mania, and fear, and loathing. I'm your host, Jason Nemoa Hardin, and on this episode, we continue our exploration into the career of Hunter S. Thompson with his most famous novel, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, a savage journey to the heart of the American dream. to get paid for it or else you're going to be locked up, end quote. With the success of Hell's Angels, which we explore on episode two of our show and some money coming in, Hunter, Sandy, and Juan moved away from San Francisco. After being unable to sell his Ford, which was virtually unusable, he blew it up with the help of 10 gallons of gasoline, a Magnum 44, and a burning towel. Hunter was done with San Francisco. It was becoming something else entirely with 50,000 to 200,000 people estimated to be coming into the city to explore what would be referred to as the summer of love. It was no place for Thompson. He wanted to move to New York, but on his way to New York, he found what would become his base the Owl Farm in Woody Creek in Aspen, Colorado, where Hunter would live for the rest of his life. Like the Haight-Ashbury district of San Francisco a few years before, Aspen was in a transitional phase and Hunter saw its potential. No one was buying property there at the time and he bought the house for $75,000. With Hell's Angels being a great success, Hunter began getting offers to write articles from all angles, Playboy, Esquire, Harper's, and others sent letters to Hunter, wanting him to write an article for them in the same electric style they had read in Hell's Angels. But many magazines didn't consider that Hunter's style wasn't for everybody. Playboy rejected an article Hunter had written for them about Jean-Claude Kelly, an Olympic skier turned Chevy pitchman, writing in a memo, Thompson's ugly, stupid arrogance is an insult to everything we stand for. Drug use, in addition to the daily alcohol abuse, became routine as well. His son Juan would later explain how guns were also just a part of life, how they would just lay around the house, often propped up in the corners behind doors. With his father being a full-time writer, Juan still did not see him very much as Hunter kept very different hours. When Juan would be eating dinner or doing homework before bed, Hunter would be eating breakfast and starting his day. He was a night owl his whole life and would wake up around 3 p.m. and sometimes as late as 7 or 8 p.m. According to Hunter, it was Sandy's job to get him up and make him breakfast, which was complicated since Hunter had very specific ideas of what breakfast entailed. Spanish omelet with bacon, mayonnaise and peanut butter, on toast with bacon, and huevos rancheros were common. He'd eat breakfast along with about six cups of coffee, with the last cup of coffee, he'd have his first beer of the day. After about four or five beers, he'd get into the whiskey or bourbon. He drank slowly, however, about one drink per hour. But when you drink for 24 or 36 hours straight along with drugs, it adds up. And throughout his time as a boozer, 
He had built up quite a resistance for alcohol, as well as drugs later on, and on more than one occasion, he would have conversations with powerful political figures and celebrities without them knowing that he was on acid, as well as other drugs and alcohol. Nineteen sixty-eight, one year after the publication of Hell's Angels, was the year that Hunter began getting more into politics. Though he never truly felt like he belonged on one end or the other of the political spectrum, he could feel that major things were happening and he, naturally, wanted to be a part of that. This is what brought him to the now infamous demonstration at the 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago. He wrote about what happened for the first time using his alter ego, Raoul Duke, as the protagonist. After seeing police use tear gas and beat and brutalize people who were merely exercising their rights as American citizens, he became even more involved in politics and began writing heavily about it. The fact that he himself was beaten by police and managed to save himself from serious head injuries because of the motorcycle helmet he was wearing influenced him directly. Weeks later, he could not talk about what he had experienced in Chicago without getting tears in his eyes. Of this experience, he would later say, I went to the Democratic Convention as a journalist and returned a raving beast. He wanted to start changing how things were and thought that Aspen could be the first town to show the way. Concerning the origins of the word gonzo, James Booker, a legendary R&B piano player from New Orleans, Louisiana, recorded an instrumental song called Gonzo in 1960. Gonzo was a Cajun slang word that circled a lot in the French Quarter jazz scene that meant to play unhinged. Now, upon hearing the song, Hunter went wild over its ferocious flute section. Gonzo soon became his favorite song. Now, when Nixon ran for president in 1968, Hunter was assigned to cover him for Pageant Magazine. He had brought with him a cassette of Booker's music and would play Gonzo over and over again on his cassette player. This drove Boston Globe journalist Bill Cardoso crazy, and he began referring to Hunter as the Gonzo Man. As he usually did with things that could be used to mock him, Hunter took ownership of it. He embraced it and made Gonzo his word. Hunter sent Jan Winner, the co-founder and editor of Rolling Stone magazine, a letter in January of 1970 where he gave him praise for the Altamont article, calling it the best piece of journalism he could remember having read by anybody. Jan Winner wrote him back, and having liked Hell's Angels, asked Hunter if he wanted to write for Rolling Stone. Hunter then explained how he was busy at the moment running for sheriff in Aspen, and then Jan suggested that Hunter could write an article about himself running as sheriff for the magazine. And when Hunter came to Jan's office, he proceeded to unpack a satchel bag full of beer cans, scotch, cigarettes, knives, can openers, smoking paraphernalia, notebooks, and an air horn. Then he talked for about an hour and a half or two about everything and nothing. That was Jan's introduction to Hunter, and they sparked up an immediate friendship. Hunter's piece, The Battle of Aspen, appeared in Rolling Stone, number 67, October 1st, 1970. The race for Sheriff had been a close one, much closer than most who worked on the campaign ever thought it would be. But in the end, Hunter lost. Only by 247 votes, however. One possible reason he lost, perhaps, is that he wanted to change the name of the city from Aspen to Fat City. This in order to keep rich people from buying up all the real estate and making it theirs. However, the most likely reason, and one that is masterfully explored in the documentary Freak Power, The Ballot or the Bomb, was corruption. As the powers that be did not want someone like him to win. In 1970, Hunter was contracted by Scanlon's magazine to do a cover on the Kentucky Derby. 
After the original illustrator for the piece fell out, he was presented with someone who would become a lifelong friend, Ralph Steadman. Over copious amounts of alcohol, Ralph got to know Hunter, who was reaching the peak of his gonzoness, acting weird and erratic and wearing eye-catching clothes, hats, and glasses. Hunter made it quite clear that he was a different creature than what Ralph was used to after he sprayed mace in a restaurant under the explanation that Ralph had upset people with his drawings and they had to go. All in all, they spent a week at the Derby, Ralph drawing all the time, but Hunter had barely written anything at all. It was obvious that the Hunter who would sit down and meticulously fuzz over a story, write and rewrite it several times over, was gone. Now he would write in sporadic jolts, getting a page out once in a while, some of it full of gibberish, some of it incredible. It was wild gunzo madness. Being able to drink and do drugs and write about these experiences, throwing in fictional accounts, with the true ones of course, it seemed like he had truly found his calling. The Kentucky Derby is decadent and depraved is the article that Hunter would eventually write and get published. It was a slight against upper-class society and against everything he felt was wrong with that world. It's a wonderfully dark, funny, and intense piece which he recommended all Hunter S. Thompson fans to hunt down and read. But before the Kentucky Derby article was delivered to the magazine, he was assigned another article by Scanlon. This time he was to go to Rhode Island to cover the American Cup. He asked Ralph if he wanted to join. Ralph, based in the UK, took the next plane over to the US. This time, though, things would get nastier. He had arranged for he and Ralph to be taken out to sea on a huge boat. When Ralph got seasick, Hunter offered some psilocybin. In the words of Ralph Stedman, that's when the screaming red-eyed dog started. It was a mad journey of hallucinations and madness that lasted for quite a while before Ralph was taken to New York in need of a doctor. Now, according to Hunter, Ralph had been up for 96 hours when he finally was administered Librium to bring him down, which subsequently put Ralph out for 24 hours straight. The Scanlon's magazine article was past its deadline, but Hunter did not have what he considered to be a final draft. Still, the magazine insisted that he send them what he had. They praised it as being a work of a genius, something that didn't sit right with him. Knowing it was not as good as it should have been, it was obvious that he was becoming wrapped up and trapped in the gonzo world he had weaved. Quote, I learned a long time ago that reality was much weirder than anyone's imagination. End quote. Jan Winner and Hunter Thompson had become friends who admired and respected one another, and with Hunter being friends with Oscar Zeta Acosta, a prominent Mexican-American political activist and attorney, he wanted to write an article about La Raza movement in Los Angeles. This was not an article in the realm of gonzoness. On the contrary, it was a serious article where Hunter did not use himself as the focal point of the story. Jan Winner agreed that it would be a good, solid, and important story, so Hunter went to work on it. It was while writing this story that Hunter and Acosta, who were spending a lot of time together, found it increasingly difficult for a brown-skinned Mexican to talk openly with a white reporter in the racially tense atmosphere of Los Angeles, California. The two concluded that they needed a more comfortable place to discuss the story and decided to take advantage of an offer Hunter had received from Sports Illustrated magazine. The offer was to write photograph captions for the annual Mint 400 Desert Race being held in Las Vegas, Nevada from March 21st through 23rd, 1971. Thompson would go on to write that the first of their Las Vegas trips was concluded by spending 36 hours alone in a hotel room, quote, feverishly writing in my notebook about his experiences. 
These writings would become the genesis of fear and loathing in Las Vegas, a savage journey to the heart of the American dream. What was originally a 250-word photo caption assignment for Sports Illustrated grew to a novel-length feature story for Rolling Stone. He first submitted a 2,500-word manuscript to Sports Illustrated that was aggressively rejected. But he knew he had something special with this article. The article, or what it would grow into, would become his most famous piece. He would state that publisher Jan Winner had liked the first 20 or so jangled pages enough to take it seriously on its own terms and tentatively scheduled it for publication, which gave me the push I needed to keep working on it. And while he was knee-deep into the first half of Fear and Loathing, he was informed by fellow Rolling Stone writer David Felton that there was to be a narcotics convention in Las Vegas, the National District Attorney's Association's third annual Institute on Narcotics and dangerous drugs, to be precise. He immediately saw it as a way to expand the story into a full-length novel. He thought it would be great fun to get completely stoned and go to the convention, and that's precisely what he and Oscar Acosta decided to do. While in Vegas for the second stint, David Felton received a phone call one night. There was screaming and what sounded like crashing dishes in the background. Hunter seemed to beside himself with fear as he shouted, I can't control him. Oscar's out of control. You gotta send money. Felton soon realized that this was part of a game. However, Felton made sure that Hunter was wired $500. Jan Winner deducted the money from Thompson's story fee, and no matter how much Hunter pleaded his case about the money being part of travel expenses, he refused to reimburse the money. And one night, after Thompson and Acosta returned to San Francisco, they were out drinking with Felton when they decided to stop by Winner's apartment. Hunter, knowing no one was home, let himself in with the key he had and subsequently came out with one of Winner's amplifiers under his arm. Now it's settled, Thompson declared. When he was satisfied with the first chapter of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, he brought the script, neatly stapled together and the right size, to the managing editors of Rolling Stone magazine and gave them a copy. To everyone at Rolling Stone's great surprise, and very much unlike Hunter's earlier work, the chapter came in one package, completely polished and cleanly typed. The manuscript was passed around the office, with each editor being given a day to read it. They were all floored by his writing. Hunter Thompson had obviously hit his stride as a master of gonzo writing. He had found his voice, his tone, and was riding the wave full with vigor. A winner agreed that once Hunter had written five to 10,000 words, that they would publish it in two parts for the fourth anniversary issue of Rolling Stone, and it would say that it was written by the narrator of the story, Raoul Duke. At Hunter's insistence, the manuscript was sent to Ralph Stedman for illustrations. Stedman then received a letter shortly thereafter telling that his art was needed for something experimental as it would allow him to do some sick drawings to express the awfulness of what he had been through with his friend Acosta. Stedman gleefully accepted. With this piece of writing, Hunter S. Thompson became a true part of the new journalism movement. Up with the greats like Tom Wolfe, Gay Talese, and David Halberstam. Though he never truly fit among them, he liked being in their company, and he knew that of all of them, he was the most unique. He was the wild one, the genius. Much of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas was written while listening to the Rolling Stones' Beggar's Banquet, which he played so many times that he wore out the tape and had to buy a new one. But it wasn't all easy. Through the writing process, Hunter wrote to Tom Wolfe concerning the difficulty he had with writing the second part of the novel. In that letter, he explained how he found it near impossible to sustain the speedy madness of the initial part for 10,000 words. He writes about how the first part was written by hand on Met Hotel stationery on a straight run, all in one place during an all-night drunken drug frenzy while he waited for dawn so he could flee without paying for the room. 
But giving the piece 10 days to rest had apparently been a big mistake as he felt that by leaving the place and his frame of mind at the time, it was impossible to touch back on the same emotion. This adds weight to why some readers cite a clear change in pace and emotion between part 1 and part 2. Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas Part 1 came out on November 11th, 1971 and was a tremendous success. Letters poured in from people who loved Hunter's writing and wanted to live life just like he had depicted in the story. They sent him drugs and photos and asked if they could accompany him on the next voyage to Vegas. One who was not happy at all with the story or how he was depicted, or more specifically the changes made to his character, was Oscar Zeta Acosta. He told staffers at Rolling Stone that he was in no way a 300-pound Samoan. Rather, he was a 250-pound Chicano attorney and that he was the true Dr. Gonzo. Hunter had in no way intended to insult his friend and merely changed his identity as he concluded that an attorney who was constantly at war with the Los Angeles judicial system did not need a Rolling Stone article about him running wild all over Vegas. The collected story in book form was published on July 7, 1972, and initially met more resistance than the article had. Despite later becoming a gem of American literature, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas didn't sell all that well on its first hardcover printing. Out of the first 80,000 printed, 20,000 remained in a warehouse for a while. He offered to buy the remaining copies with the plan of letting them age, then sell them as signed copies when he needed money in the future. Then Jan Winner became involved in the process of trying to buy the remaining 20,000 copies. But it never came to be. Hunter then came up with the story that Jan had indeed bought them all and buried them and would sell them after his death. It was too funny of a story to deny, and Jan went along with it. Now, for those curious, when Hunter was asked if they in fact did bring as many drugs and booze with them, and if they in fact did them as much as he wrote they did, Hunter wouldn't give a straight answer. Instead, he said, fiction is the truest form of journalism. Faulkner said something like that. You figure it out. <laughs> Quote, Walk tall, kick ass, learn to speak Arabic, love music, and never forget you come from a long line of truth seekers, lovers, and warriors. End quote. After Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, Hunter S. Thompson had two great books under his belt and a stable job at Rolling Stone. So the only logical question was, what to do next? Talking to Jan, he decided that he wanted to cover the 1972 presidential election and they put him on a salary of $17,000 a year, which was a big deal for Rolling Stone at the time. The magazine was getting more into politics and with Hunter attached to the political book, he took Sandy and Juan and moved to a brick house in Washington, D.C., which Rolling Stone paid for. But he did not want to slow down. He wanted to get on the road and keep moving. And from there, the madness would roll on. As usual, I will leave you with one final quote from the mad genius himself. Life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body, but rather to skid in broadside in a cloud of smoke, thoroughly used up, totally worn out and loudly proclaiming, wow, what a ride. <laughs> End quote. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and will spread the word about the podcast. Once again, I have been your host, Jason and Moore Harden. We here at House of Words ask that you please consider helping to make this show easier to produce and more frequent by contributing on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash houseofwords or paypal.me slash houseofwordspodcast. Alternatively, you can subscribe and encourage others to subscribe to our YouTube page, House of Words Podcast. Every little bit helps more than you might think. Until next time.
Keep turning those pages. House of Words is written and produced by Christo M. Sanchez. Narrated and edited by me, Jason Nemore Harden. And music by Creature Nine and Wood. All rights and ownership belong to Christo M. Sanchez and Jason Nemore Harden. <laughs>